uncertainty in how to write requirements and on on something you don't know about. We have this chicken and egg problem. We 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 want to, and this is this is generally true for for many of our missions where you're going to a place for the first time, where you're trying to design a vehicle or a system that survives an environment where the environment itself is there is the reason you're going to find the environment out, figure out what it's all about. So you have this this it was how do you design something for a place that you don't know about. Well, in the case of Mars, there are many cases we, the areas that we do know about, but there's one area in particular that we have pretty vague understanding about, and that's the atmosphere, the, and, the, and particularly the winds and the dynamical conditions of the atmosphere of Mars. We only, we don't have, we've had uh, a pair of weather stations in, in the 70s, the, the Viking landers. We also have measurements as we fly through the atmosphere to get the measurements there from those two vehicles. And we made some measurements from Mars Pathfinder, but we've not made a lot since. So we really don't have a lot of information. In fact, when we were designing uh, Mars Pathfinder, we said, well, what are we going to do? For, we need a wind model. We need to come out to figure out what the winds aloft look like. And we said to ourselves, well, how do we do that? We don't have any data. Well, and we, at the time, there were not the computer models in the, in the, in the early 90s. We didn't have the computer models that, that, would allow, that we use for Earth that we can extrapolate to Mars, and we've done that since. One of the things we had done in, in our effort to try to mitigate the dynamics conditions, at least the swinging, is we put, we changed the design from Mars Path on it. We added three little rockets. There are three big rockets that point down to stop the velocity, but we added three rockets that are pointed transversely that if the, if the vehicle was at an angle, the, the software would figure that out from the sensors on the back shell. And these rockets, we would pick the, which of the three or combinations of three rockets we would fire to push the thing over in the instant before the rockets were complete, rocket firing was complete, so that so we could kind of cancel out that motion and actually write the systems like an attitude control system. It forces it to be vertical. Well, that's a great idea. So that helps with the angle. But what if, what if we discover with the new computer models that we're now using for the atmosphere? We're not using KSC anymore. We're using these new supercomputer global circulation models that we now use on Earth, we've extrapolated to the surface of Mars. They're still theoretical, but at least they're based in physics. So now this particular system, MER and Mars Pathfinder, uses a parachute, a rocket, and a lander with, a, with a, some airbags surrounding it. That's, that's sort of what it looks like in the, in the seconds before hitting the ground, before the rockets fire. But the dynamics, this is a three-body system. It's, it can be very subject to the vagaries of winds. As if the winds cause the system to, pump, uh, if, it, if the winds pumped energy into this three-body system, you can end up having the, the, the system moving in this interesting um, modes. Now, what's wrong with that? Well, nothing is really wrong with it then. The problem is, later on, when the solid rockets fire to slow it down, the rockets are designed, are assumed that the system will is straight up and down when it fires, and that all the velocity is up and down. But if, you're velo- if you have either a horizontal velocity already, or if, if you're just at an angle, those rockets will do a great job of getting the system accelerated horizontally. Now, that's not good for the airbags. The airbags are, are, prefer this, and but we've, we've always, but even on Mars Pathfinder, we knew that this threat existed. So we had to do a lot of testing of the airbags, impacting the ground with a grazing angle on rocks. So we built up these test, test program to test to see what these airbags can do on rocks. And we use the fantastic Plum, Plumbrook station uh, at, at Sandusky, Ohio. It's run by uh, uh, NASA Glenn. Uh, this fantastic vacuum chamber called the SPF. It's a massive facility. We built up Mars and we dropped our airbags on this giant wall of rocks, hitting it up to 70 miles an hour, going really fast. But still, there are conditions where the engines can do more damage uh, and winds, com- com- combination, where the system's actually hitting faster than we can even test. And we're pretty darn certain that if you go much higher than about, say, 26 to 28 meters per second at these grazing angles, uh, you're, you're probably going to lose your vehicle. And so there are actually conditions where Mars would actually be, could provide us more uh, environmentally challenging circumstances than our vehicles survive. And now, now that's actually true for all of our vehicles. That's true, been true for the, the Viking landers. They're very sensitive to rocks and slopes and tip over. 
It's true for the Phoenix lander. So what we try to do is we try to solve that problem by going to places on Mars where there's not much rocks or slopes. In the case of the Mars Exploration Rovers, we were trying to go to a place where there's rocks and slopes because that was part of the geological mission. So we thought the airbags would be good for that. But if you know, the, its Achilles heel was winds. So, we, so in uh, about the second year of the Mars Exploration Rover mission, we were f- doing airbag testings. The tr- we were using the same design as Mars Pathfinder, except one little detail. The, the tetrahedral lander with the rover stuffed in it, even though it's the same size and geometry as Mars Pathfinder, it was actually getting heavier, heavier and heavier and heavier. We were stuffing more stuff. The rover was getting heavier. Everything about it was getting heavier. And we were finding ourselves it was heavier by 50% than what we flew on Mars Pathfinder. Now, does that mean the airbags will work with the same velocity conditions? Well, it turns out no. We started doing these testing, this, these drop tests at this giant vacuum cha- chamber at, at Sandusky, Ohio, and we found that that, this, that the airbags were being tearing themselves to pieces on these rocks, and we were getting gashes the size of you know four or five feet across, huge. And we were like, we were starting to get worried. So hey, you know these airbags just aren't going to cut it. We were learning about the possibility that there is not just the, the sh- wind shear that can cause these things to bounce around, but also some pretty decent steady state winds that can cause this, even though you're coming through this very thin atmosphere, the parachute is really good at picking up those speed velocities. And off it goes, racing along the, the, the surface of Mars, well, as it descends, maybe you know, 20, 30, 40 miles an hour, pretty fast. Well. If you add that to this problem, we're in deep trouble. These airbags with a heavier rover isn't going to cut it. And we're just guessing at this atmosphere, and it could even be worse than what we're imagining. So we said to ourselves, what are we going to do? And I was, uh, and at, at, after this meeting we had, a, 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 a looking through the airbag test results, I was saying to myself, you know, those little rockets would help in all the, if we knew, if the software on board the vehicle knew how fast you were moving, not only can those rockets help write it, but those rockets can actually help induce an angle which would counter the winds. But, all, but we have no way of knowing how fast we're moving across the surface. We can measure our velocity this way with our radar, but not horizontally. Now it turns out we, this vehicle has nine cameras on the rover. And there is actually 10 camera ports of which one of them has the wires routed out to the lander because we thought we might need it. Turns out we didn't. So we had a spare camera electrical port to the software. All we needed was the camera to go with it. Now if I put a camera on the lander, I could use the camera to look down in, in real time, take pictures, the software processes those pictures, figures out from the differences from these pictures how fast you're moving horizontally, we could f- infer the velocity of the, of, the, uh, of the horizontal system, of the velocity, the whole system, including dealing with the swinging. And we can take those all into account and to figure out the right combination of, of rockets to fire to cancel that wind. For example, we said nothing about the software and the system with the camera, we call it the Descent Image Motion Estimation System called DIMES. The rockets are called TIRS or Transverse Impulse Rocket uh, System. And the combination of those two things, our goal was is that they should do no harm. That the probability that this system would, would see a velocity and induce and lie to us, lie to the software and said, oh, we're moving really fast and, really, and it's really not moving fast, would be so small as to be negligible. So the idea is that it could only do good. It could do no harm. That was our going in position. And we knew how to, what that meant from an engineering perspective and how to design it that way and to prove to a set of very critical, many, many reviews and many, many very critical reviewers, including many experts from around the country who said at first this was just too hard. But we we pushed it and pushed it and we knocked every single issue out, every concern that they had, and we ended up flying it to Mars. And it turns out on our first landing, we used it 
and it may very well have saved the mission because the, the, we had a very, turns out we had not only had an angle this way, but we also, when the rockets fired, we were also happy moving about 10 meters per second horizontally. And the combination, had we not then fired these rockets based on this data from the camera, we would have ended up take bouncing right into the southern rim of Bonneville Crater, where we knew from subsequent exploration that there were these very sharp uh, vent effects. These are rocks that have been carved to the shape of spikes by millions, if not billions of years of uh, uh, wind erosion. So uh, we were very relieved that we flew it. But it, so, so what this lesson, get to, the bottom line is that this lesson is, is that um, you can't put requirements on a, on, a, on a planet. You can't give a, re a requirement on Mars that you, Mars shall have winds less than this. Or if, if, you say, if you say to yourself, we shall design our system for winds less than, say, 10 meters per second or 5 meters per second, whatever number you pick, um, you have to be, think bigger than that. You have to realize that, that the extent of knowledge of this environment with the experts is actually not that high. And you have to, as a system engineer, you need to be cognizant of the uncertainties in the environment that that, are, that is being specified for you by environmental specialists, and that and and if you're if you have the ability to do it, you can hedge your bets by adding complexity and systems to try to deal with unexpected environmental conditions or conditions that may be worse than the specified environment that the experts have predicted. Because it turns out you're asking them a very difficult question. And when they give you an answer, you have to be aware of the fact that they may not be certain that that answer is correct. 